Hi, my name is Susie. I'm an activist and a journalist from Auckland, New Zealand. For years, I've worked on controversial issues like the corruption of our intelligence agencies. I was severely targeted as a result of my work. This led to my articles being amplified by the world's most accomplished publisher. In 2016, I made a documentary about how and why I was forced to leave my country. I have now sought refuge in Russia and my situation has become public. On 882 6PR, the voice of Perth. It's 12.30 right now and Tony with you and I'm really happy we finally got through to uh, Moscow to my friend over there, Susie Dawson. You're listening to a 95 BFM podcast. Susie Dawson is a Kiwi activist and journalist who worked as a member of Occupy Auckland's media team at that time. Now, five years later and following involvement in GCSB and TPPA opposition, she's seeking asylum in Russia alleging she has been spied on, harassed and threatened by the police. Welcome back to The Wire. Now, finally on the show today, last week it was announced that Susie Dawson will be the new leader of the Internet Party. Welcome to the Jimmy Dore Show. We have a special guest with us. It's Susie Dawson. She's an activist, journalist, former party leader and current president of the Internet Party. Susie Dawson, an activist and citizen journalist currently seeking asylum in Moscow, Susie has written extensively on surveillance and the deep state and claims it's not safe for her in New Zealand. My name is Craig Tuck. I'm a lawyer from New Zealand. I act in the area of international human rights. I act for Susie Dawson along with a group of other lawyers throughout the world who act for journalists and dissenters in high profile cases including the case of Julian Assange. As far back as 2012, Susie has been trying to warn New Zealanders and other citizens around the world about state targeting and surveillance of citizens and the methods being used to do it. Surveillance in New Zealand is now so widespread, it's not an issue of police going and getting a warrant and doing an investigation and then it all coming out in court. The vast majority of the surveillance that's undertaken is never going to be aired in a courtroom. And by that I'm talking about cell phone technologies, I'm talking about lawful interception is the term that the companies that do this like to use. There is a corporation in Wellington, New Zealand called SSI Corp. And you can Google them and you can look at their website. And on their website they're so good as to explain at length exactly what they do and and how legal it is for them to do it. And essentially they can intercept virtually any communication. If they have someone at range, they can hear your actual conversations, but also through cell phones, they can essentially turn them into microphones and hear any conversation that's had within vicinity. They can see your text messages, they can see what photos are on your phone, they can see what files are on your phone, they can read your emails, they can just intercept all kinds of information. Any intelligence service in the world that has significant funding and a real technological research team can own that phone the minute it connects to their network. As soon as you turn it on, it can be theirs. They can turn it into a microphone, they can take pictures from it, they can take the data off of it. But it's important to understand that these things are typically done on a targeted basis. Not only was Susie essentially blowing a whistle on state level spying, She was naming the precise entities that years later it would be proven had in fact been doing it. And the fact that these are private corporations that are doing it should be really concerning to us. The crowd that they got, that they outsourced it to, was TCIL, which was, I believe, Thompson & Clark Investigations Limited. The state is contracting a private company to surveil you. To me, that's really immoral, absolutely immoral. Some six years later, in December 2018, an official State Services Commission report confirmed that New Zealand government agencies had been employing Thompson and Clark Investigations Limited to target New Zealand citizens. This is a private company that had essentially been instructed by state agencies and departments to spy on citizens. More than 
than a dozen police staff are under investigation for passing sensitive information to the private investigators Thompson and Clark. Thompson and Clark. Security firm Thompson and Clark. Thompson and Clark. Uh, Thompson and Clark. So Thompson and Clark, aren't they? Aren't some of them old police officers? Ah, uh, yes, they are. Okay, so does that explain the relationship and the free flow of information? Doesn't it actually seem a bit crass? Um, well. At the end of the day, I guess um, what I trust is people's intent. This report identifies perhaps inappropriately close relationships. Morning teas paid for by um, Thompson and Clark. Invitations to go out for drinks. Were there other companies oh. identified where you inappropriately gave them information or just Thompson and Clark? Um, there, there are a myriad of security companies who inquire of police every day. For instance, insurance mm. security. But that's not my question. People listening to this will think, hey, Thompson and Clark were getting stellar, top shelf, gold star treatment from the police. Why? Do you treat other security firms the same as you were treating this one? Yeah. How do you seriously think it looks to, to members of the public listening to this? Thompson and Clark hasn't just been paid by the government to spy on Greenpeace and earthquake claimants in Christchurch. Tonight, Checkpoint can reveal the controversial security firm has been also monitoring the activities of another three activist groups in Northland, Coromandel and Wellington and the activities of at least one further claimant. Susie has been involved at the very highest levels with people facing charges from prosecutions coming out of the Eastern District Court of Virginia in the United States. There are more prosecutions to follow of currently unnamed persons. Importantly, information will be coming out in the months to come that will provide transparency and clarity and lead to accountability. Suppression and prosecution of dissenters can't be allowed in New Zealand or elsewhere. That's why Susie's team is launching the hashtag One vs Five I campaign and with your help can achieve some important victories for democracy and for each and every one of us.
Hi everybody, my name is Susie Dawson. I'm an activist, a journalist, and the current president of the Internet Party of New Zealand. Thank you so much for being here for this third episode of the One Versus Five Eye live series, opening the five eyes, exposing the methods of the spies. Can you please just let me know in chat if you can hear and see me okay? And then we'll get started with tonight's stream. Awesome. Cool, hi. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so if you've been watching the series, we, in the very first week, had a very high-level overview of what the Five Eyes intelligence apparatus is and some of my concerns around the way that it functions. In the second week, I had my friend Elizabeth Mueller, who's a fellow targeted activist and researcher, on to talk about her findings from the WikiLeaks project I See Watch. And we had a look through some of the different job descriptions and uh, details of what various subcontractors of the global intelligence apparatus have been doing based on information from their own CVs. If you were here with me in the first week, you would have seen a slideshow of uh, slides that I put together in a presentation. And this week I've expanded upon that. So we're gonna revisit that in a second. I just wanna let you know that this is a fundraising stream for the One Versus Five Eye campaign. I am endeavoring to take action against the agencies that have violated my rights and the rights of many other citizens around the world. So hopefully our awesome team of social media admins will be distributing links to the One Versus Five Eye website and to our donation page. And I would ask you all to, if you can't donate, at least to circulate that link and spread it to as many people as possible so that we can build a war chest for my legal team to take on these agencies. With that, I'm gonna screen share and we're gonna get into the presentation. So these are the screens that you would have seen in week one of this series. We talked about who the five eyes are and the different collections of eyes. We talked about the relationships that the, what the NSA calls its global network has with its partner agencies from various countries around the world who are effectively vassals of this international security state. We talked about their adversaries and targets and we talked about prospective countries who are not yet owned by the global network, but are on the agenda to be. Then we talked about the way that the global network sucks up all of the data from these countries all around the world, but then gives some portion of that data back to those countries. We talked about the legislation and policy framework that underpins all of this. And we talked about latest legislative trends, anti-privacy trends and anti-due process trends. So tonight what I'm gonna do is something that is long awaited and which was actually voted on by my viewers and my followers tonight. And that is to look at the ways that the global network has infiltrated and taken control of all of the aspects of our Western societies. So there are certain elements involved with that. Oh, hold on one second. My computer has decided to dump the new screens. Hold on. What a surprise. Fortunately, I took steps to ensure that this wouldn't be a problem for us. It is amazing the technological hop, skips and jumps that I have to go through in order to be able to 
give you guys this information. And here we go, I've got it. Okay, it's okay. Right, how the global network controls society. So there are four key areas underpinning our modern life that I have uh, assessed and proven through my study of NSA documents from the Snowden files and of WikiLeaks files and other sources um, are under attack by the intelligence agencies or which they have total control over. So there is the political sphere, there is technology, there is the economic sphere and education. These are the four key areas. And how they do this, in the political sphere, they have controlled it using coercion, they have controlled it using subversion, and they've controlled it using infiltration. And in the next slide, we're going to get into that a little deeper. In the technology sphere, they have taken control of innovation, of development of technology, and of access to technology. In the economic sphere, they have, through their customers of the intelligence agencies, which we've talked about a little bit about in the past, the customers are the, ultimately the beneficiaries of the products of the spying, using espionage and slush funds that are outside of the purview of Congress or of oversight committees. That's how they've taken control of the economic sphere. And with education, they have two-way reciprocal relationships with key figures right across the educational sphere. They use universities as a recruitment pool, a breeding ground for new agents and new cohorts for the global intelligence apparatus. And also appropriation of knowledge and information and development um, from the educational sector. So we're going to move right into it and start with breaking down their control of politics. In the political sphere, they, they use um, international relations as a cover for their activities. So in the uh, post 9-11 terrorism legislation, you will see time and time again that any uh, threat to the relationships between countries or states is now considered a threat to national security. And that is um, the gateway to them justifying using counterterrorism forces, resources, programs, networks against said threats to international relations. We talked a little bit previously about my article called Glenn Greenwald and the Irrelevance of Electoral Politics. In that article, I cite a slide from the NSA. And that slide talks about how the NSA doesn't actually care whether a left-wing or a right-wing government it comes to power in any given country because they say that their military partnerships that underpin the intelligence apparatus globally are not affected by electoral politics. And in that slide, they talk about perturbations. Perturbations basically means disruptions. The intelligence agencies are obsessed with risk management and therefore with anything that might disrupt their control over global society. Therefore, they don't see a left or a right party coming in as a perturbation but or a risk to them, but they would see anything that affects their the standing of their relationships at a military intelligence sharing level or 
as it relates to the relationships between the global network and partner agencies in various countries. They consider that to be the ultimate threat that must be mitigated. So it's not actually about electoral politics. It's about military information, intelligence, and data sharing policies. That is what they care about more than anything else. And because we don't vote the intelligence agencies in and we can't vote them out, they have effectively become an unelected state. Politicians come and go, political parties come and go, election cycles come and go, but these intelligence agencies don't come and go. They are a permanent unelected state. They have their own priorities, their own policies, and we didn't get to vote on any of it. And that is the fundamental issue that I have with these networks. They are acting for their own gain and not for ours as a society. So in the political sphere, they have been openly using coercion now. I mean, this used to be kind of under the swept under the rug or behind closed doors, but as we know, was it Schumer, I believe, who got on uh, network television in the United States and said, if you mess with the intelligence agencies, they've got six ways from Sunday of getting back at you, quite famously said that. That is the type of subtle coercion that is used against politicians. Every politician knows that if they take on the military industrial complex, their political life is going to be very short and probably very uncomfortable. The other thing that we've seen now is the overt infiltration of electoral politics by intelligence assets. Now, I'll just talk about this for a little, for a minute. I've often cited a WikiLeaks document that proved that the NSA had, and the CIA, had shopped out to the Five Eyes, which means to Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the UK, had shopped out the infiltration of French political parties in the, I believe, 2012 uh, French presidential elections. So the NSA was dispatching foreign spies from the rest of the Five Eyes to interfere in the French presidential election. I mean, talk about Russiagate. This is like a France gate, but of course you won't hear about it in the mainstream media. That was a covert example of political interference by the agencies in the sovereign affairs of a nation state. However, we now have overt infiltration of the political process by the intelligence agencies. As we know, there is what's being called the CIA Democrats, but you can be sure that it's not just the Democratic Party that will be infiltrated by intelligence agencies. We see now that an alumni of intelligence agencies, you know, and that's putting it kindly, that's if they aren't still active agents, um, are openly running for office and are even promoting themselves. Uh, and their affiliate based on their affiliations with the intelligence services. So the interference is now right in front of our face. <laughs> the, um, the relationships are being openly acknowledged, uh, but there is very little of any discussion about what is the impact on our society of having intelligence agents who have loyalties to intelligence services whose careers have been based on and funded by intelligence services, uh, being seeking uh, democratic office, and especially when they're coming from agencies that are pro at disrupting, infiltrating, sabotaging, and meddling in the outcomes of uh, supposedly democratic processes around the world. Where is my slide show? Right. So then there's the subversion of the political realm by the intelligence agencies. And you can see that subversion in terms of them openly spying on oversight committees, 
um, you can see that subversion where the policies and actions of the intelligence agencies do not match the stated policies of their supposed uh, bosses. So you can see, for example, I mean, another great example of that actually um, is Whitlam in 1975 in Australia. You have a prime minister of Australia and he did not know that Australia was a member of the Five Eyes. He had no idea. He was simply not informed. That's a classic example of intelligence agencies subverting the political process. What is the point of us having elections and voting people into power based on their policies if the military industrial complex simply subverts the will of the elected representatives of the people? Right, and then coercion in and of itself is either about tacit, implied, or open threats. And one of the biggest threats that politicians face post 9-11 is this threat of terrorism. And Snowden has talked a lot about this. He's uh, talked about the way that the global network will threaten um, potential partners um, by saying, you know, well, if you don't participate and become a partner agency of the global network, what happens if you don't receive information from us and there is a terrorism attack? But you also see this in terms of politicians. Politicians who may want to cut funding to the agencies or who may not want to expand their budgets or their reach um, are quickly silenced by this threat of terrorism because it's the eternal justification for the endless growth of these agencies is terrorism, terrorism, terrorism. And so that is used as a threat against other countries and to get them to join the global network, but it's also used as a threat against politicians because as Snowden says, no politician wants to be the guy that didn't fund the agency that could have stopped the terrorist attack. Right, and then of course, um, military intel intelligence complex funding. So how many elected representatives in America right now are being funded by Boeing, are being funded by General Dynamics, are being funded by uh, private corporations in the intelligence sector or um, businesses that are a part of what Donald Rumsfeld called, uh, called the total force? which is all of those private military contractors that have been financially profiting from the many wars that America has involved itself in and or really started since 2001. We know the vast majority of our political representatives have financial ties to the military industrial complex. And it is virtually impossible for uh, their political opponents to achieve the same funding levels and therefore to compete uh, in election campaigns. Tulsi Gabbard would be another great example of this. Tulsi Gabbard taking a stand against the military industrial complex means she doesn't get military industrial complex money, which means she doesn't get promoted on media networks, which are similarly funded by military industrial complex money. You know, when we see the the ads of weapons manufacturers and the ads of security companies and whatnot on networks, um, they are, that funding gives those uh, networks a vested interest in suppressing any voice that is that would be willing or brave enough to take a stand against the military industrial complex. Right, so we know that the media 
has also taken a turn for the worse since it has begun hiring ex and or current uh, intelligence personnel and even executives as talking heads or so-called subject matter experts on its channels. Uh, it seems that yet again the covert has become the overt. So we know from Mockingbird, Mockingbird onwards that there has been intelligence agency infiltration of the mass media. But it seems that now they don't even need to do that. They can just openly place their people uh, in prominent positions on major networks and they have been able to openly push information ops narratives that previously they would have had to hide um, having done so. The other thing that we see is the infiltration of NGOs, think tanks um, in the public sphere as well. So organisations that have the appearance of serving the public interest, but which are yet again being staffed by ex or current intelligence personnel that are being funded by, again, the military industrial complex. The oversight, has, as we talked about, has been thoroughly subverted. I covered this in a previous episode. We talked about the NSA directives and policy, where that was coming from, and, um, and we talked about the liaison officers at the NSA and how they were proactively uh, putting a chokehold on information reaching the overseers from the intelligence agencies. But the other thing that we've seen, and also which Snowden has extensively talked about, is the willingness of intelligence agency executives to just flat out lie in congressional testimony. So they, you know, from Clapper on down, will sit there and just literally lie on C-SPAN to the public and lie directly to their overseers. And we've also seen that they do so with impunity. There is absolutely no negative impact on them for having done so. We've also seen from studying the NSA documents that there is a humongous obsession inside the NSA with uh, what they call budget day. And this is where once a year they prepare their budgets for congressional over, uh, approval. And there are multiple documents uh, in the NSA Snowden files where the NSA is warning its personnel, do not submit anything which may in any way justify um, restriction of our funding. Um, and they also tell their personnel that if they run their documents past a certain budgeting office, that they will be sure to reword their requests and applications in a way which is uh, most likely to maximise the funding that they can get from Congress for their activities. So receiving the maximum amount of money possible is absolutely and definitely uh, one of their strategic objectives. They are obsessed with stopping Congress getting information about their activities, but yet maximizing the amount of money that they can get Congress to approve for their activities. And they have no qualms about bending the truth in order to be able to justify that. So that is my overview of the political subversion or the subversion of the political sphere by the intelligence agencies. And I'm sure you guys are probably already screenshotting that and sharing it on social media. Now I'm going to move on to the technological sphere. So this is something pretty close to my heart and there is a, it is a really big discussion. So in the technology sphere, we know that they control the cables for almost the entire planet, literally at cables. And I'm talking about the undersea cables by which data and information is transmitted around the world um, from entire countries and continents. 
we know that from the AT and T revelations going back years and um, many others that the telcos and the internet service providers are also under the control of the intelligence services. So in New Zealand specifically, I can tell you they have the uh, telecom in, in, uh, telecom interception capability act or the it's actually Tix Act, T-I-C-S in New Zealand, which legally bound all information services pro uh, providers in New Zealand to make themselves in, uh, intercept capable and or intercept ready. What that meant is that every ISP in New Zealand had to build a back door into the network that linked directly to the GCSB, which is New Zealand's NSA. And this is a pattern, this legislation is a pattern that is rolled out across the world. So every ISP is mandated to not only cooperate directly with the intelligence services, but to provide them at an architectural level, an open door into their systems so that they can access the information within them at will. They also have been deputizing the staff members of internet service providers. Sorry, look at me stumbling over my words tonight. Internet service providers. They actually deputize um, a staff member who is responsible specifically with fulfilling any information requests from the intelligence agencies. And that uh, staff member receives a security clearance as if they were an intelligence agency uh, staff member but in fact they're just working for the ISP and their job becomes to facilitate the smooth handover and transition of any data or information that the agencies would want. Now another thing that we've seen in New Zealand is the restriction of the number of people or raising I'd say a raising of the bar of entry into actually uh, establishing a new internet service provider. So what they're trying to do is make the cost of compliance so high that only corporations could ever afford to set up an ISP uh, and be able to comply with the government regu regulations. If you remember in the 90s and in the early 00s, it was actually pretty easy to set up your own ISP. Uh, it was pretty easy to... I mean, guys would, you know, have a router out the back and serve a couple hundred people and voila, they're an ISP. But what they're trying to do now is make it impossible for that to happen, make it impossible for there to be innovation in the ISP space because they want to uh, have only a small number of corporations who they need to deal with in order to maintain the control system over the ISPs that they want to have. So that's just yet another worrying trend that has been going on. Okay, so on top of that, we've also seen that the intelligence agencies are obsessed with gaining backdoors in hardware, also compromising hardware supply chains. There's been a lot of work done around demonstrating that. Um, and obviously software as well. So we, and likewise, they like these monopolies to exist in the hardware and software space, just like they want to create monopolies and maintain monopolies in the telco and ISP space. So we have how many cell phones in this world? We have hundreds of millions, if not by now, probably a billion cell phones in this world. And how many operating systems are they running? I mean, we have nearly the entire planet is on two operating systems, two mobile operating systems. Why do you think that is? How can it be that on a planet the size of ours and with as many software developers as we have, that there's only two major, really two major um, operating systems for mobile communications? And it comes back to that same principle. The intelligence agencies are actively restricting innovation in the technology space and particularly in mobile, anything related to internet, they want to control who is supplying hardware and software services to the consumer markets. And it's easier for them to control 
if there are a very small number of corporations that are dominating those markets. And so it's in their best interest to prevent people from being able to develop alternatives to that. And that's something that you see across the uh, tech sector as I'm going to get to now. So in innovation, we've, we all know, you know, the CIA has MQTEL, they, um, they use money. It's another form of coercion. They will identify projects, development projects, which are of strategic importance to them, and they will fund them. And in funding them, they're then able to control the direction of that project. They're able to control who is or isn't involved in the advancement of that project. They're able to control the corporate relationships of the, that project. Um, they are able to also, the other side of the coin, if you don't take their money and you don't work with them, they're actually able to effectively destroy uh, any startup that gets in their way. And this is what you see time and time again is that you get this whole infiltration and subversion playbook rolled out against anybody who won't cooperate with allowing their, corporate, their companies or their projects um, to be controlled by the intelligence agency apparatus. We see them pr uh, picking and choosing which entrepreneurs will be allowed to be successful. We, in the Western world, we operate under this fallacy, this complete fallacy of a meritocracy. We're told, like, anybody can become a millionaire if you have a great idea and you work really, really hard and you have good people around you, you can be the next Bill Gates. I'm telling you for a fact, that's bullshit. And Kim.com is a classic example of that. Kim.com had great ideas and great people and built amazing products that everybody liked and hundreds of millions of people were using and was consuming 4% of global internet traffic. And what happened to Kim.com? Oh, hello. His house was raided by 100 armed police with helicopters and attack dogs and he's now been through seven years of litigation and they're attempting to extradite him. Where, do, where are they attempting to extradite him to? They're attempting to extradite him to the Eastern District Court of Virginia, which is the same court that prosecuted John Kiriakou that is trying to extradite and prosecute Julian Assange and that wants to prosecute Edward Snowden. So why is he being um, prosecuted in the Eastern District Court of Virginia? Apparently for copyright infringement. Copyright infringement is a civil offence and not a criminal offence. And yet his home is raided. All of his personal belongings are seized. His business is forcibly shut down. The FBI seized his domains and his websites. All of his customer data was erased from the face of this earth. And he has been relentlessly persecuted and smeared in the media. Why? Because the meritocracy does not exist. Because Kim.com was supporting WikiLeaks, Kim.com took a stand against the intelligence agencies and would not capitulate and allow his business to be run by them. And as a result, he became a target of them. And this is what happens at all levels of technological development. If your project shows any promise or, or any significance, you will either be bought out or you will be destroyed. This is how they operate. They will waive the money as the, the you know, you get the money or you get the stick, basically. <laughs> and the stick is that they will shut you down by any means necessary. And the, the thing that's the most interesting to me is that the way that these takedowns happen is um, very, very similar to the targeting that you see in the activism sphere, um, targeting in various spheres. The exact same tactics, the same methods get used. In Kim's case, it was on a much larger scale because they were going after hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of business. But ultimately, the types of methods used against him, the lawfare, the um, arrests on false pretenses, the attempted extraditions, these are what we've seen against multiple journalists, publishers, activists around the world. Uh, the reason for that is because the persecutors are the same. And that is the intelligence agencies of the NSA's 
global network. So, um, they want to control the strategic development of technology because they need to be able to respond to it and to have time to have worked out how to exploit those systems before those systems are rolled out. This is another thing that we see inside the NSA documents. Um, the NSA documents from, I think, circa 2002 were talking about the advent of Wi-Fi. So the NSA could see and knew already from basically spying on R&D that the future of the internet was going to be Wi-Fi. Eventually everybody would have access to Wi-Fi and they wanted to make sure that they did two things. One, they wanted to control the strategic development of the technology. What, what this means is they wanna control how fast it's being developed and when it's going to emerge on the corporate, on the consumer market, they actually control when we receive access to technology and to innovation. And the reason for that, well, is twofold. One, they want themselves to have access to it before anybody else does for their own benefit. And they are light years ahead of, of us normal people in terms of the types of technology that they have access to. And secondly, because they want to already have pwned that technology. They want to already control it from the architectural level. They already want their back doors to be established. They already want the ways in which they manipulate and use um, it to spy on us to be well established long before we're ever ordering that product and having it delivered in a box to our doorstep. They maintain themselves their own technological supremacy by making sure that they are 10 steps ahead of consumers. So they are already interfering in strategic technological development when it's at concept level long before projects are even funded and things start to be built, the NSA has already got their fingers in it. The global network has already got their fingers in it. And they're exploiting, they're using and exploiting that technology before any of us ever have access to that technology. So I want to talk about access actually. Um, access is a really interesting topic and I, I wrote about this. Where did I write about this? I wrote about this, I think, in an article that I did about the Tor project. Um, and I might actually just quickly pull that up because I explained it really well in the article. Let's see. Here we go. So this is an article I wrote on Contraspin back in December of 2014. So I was still in New Zealand actually when I wrote this. Right, here we go. The level playing field, I've called it, the subsection of the article. Um, the article, if social media admins want to share it, is called Deciphering the Tor Project. Okay, so I'll just read you this excerpt that called the level playing field. So in this, I was talking about best practice technologies and how um, something being best practice for the government doesn't mean that the government wants the public to have access to using best practice. They actually want us to have subgrade technology. They want us to have um, technology that is not as advanced or up to date as they themselves possess. And that's because um, I've got here widespread uptake and competent use of tools of best practice tools would create a level playing field that is inherently unattractive to power. Access to technology has always been the great divide between the haves and the have nots. And where is the, somewhere here I talk about, the order 
in which, ah, here we go, this is it. Uh, protecting um, they're protecting monopolies by stifling digital evolution, protecting the dynasties, the old boys club, serving the general public is barely on the radar. We, the general public, are at the bottom of the access spectrum where technology is concerned. First comes the military, then the military industrial complex. These days it is easier to think of it as the military con commercial complex, thanks to the wonders of privatization of functions that were traditionally performed within the realm of government. Then comes commercial, then comes the American public and select others. Then follows the rest of the world's countries in the order in which they are favored by the Americans and then follows the rest of the world. And I'm explaining that this is why projects like the Tor Project are initially government funded and why attacks on them begin at which the point is, uh, at the point at which the technology is finally filtering through into the public sphere. And I actually think this is such an important point that I would like to task it. Uh, I would actually like to chart it for you so that you can get a visual understanding of what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna do something I haven't done before, but which I think is a really good um, exercise. And that is that I'm actually gonna create one of my little slides right here for you. And I'm gonna call it the Access Waterfall. for technology. Who gets technology first? And the answer to that is the military gets it first. They get it first because the global network, in fact, I'll say the military via espionage, the, the global network is literally spying on innovators around the globe, seeing what they're doing, what they're going to be doing, working out then prior, or prioritizing uh, what technologies they want to get their hands on first and or developing their own. Because I should mention that obviously the military has its own R&D programs as well, but it is Strong, it has a very strong interest in um, simply stealing the secrets of other nations or other co foreign corporations, et cetera, et cetera. So the military has access to technology long before we do. And after the military is what I call the military industrial complex. So this is where the contractors, etc., cetera, um, are also given uh, access to cutting edge technology that is not yet available in the commercial space. So I'll just give a couple of quick examples there. In terms of the military having primary access, in one of the NSA documents, it talks about, it's talking about 1990. And it's talking about how um, the global network, as it existed in 1990, uh, already operated and had access to a multinational multimedia portal. So they were sharing videos and picture files between themselves in 1990. Now, in 1990, we were using monochrome screens, and we we're lucky if we could use a news group. We didn't have email and these guys were sharing like video files and photos with each other the way that we were in what, like 99, 2000, 2001. And this is what I mean about we're a decade behind them. And just in terms of the military industrial complex getting access to technology before any of us do, um, there are some fantastic WikiLeaks files about that. So um, in WikiLeaks hacking team files. So this is an Italian uh, 
corporation, private hacking corporate, mercenary hacking corporation called the Hacking Team. In their emails, which were leaked to WikiLeaks, they had um, marketing materials from uh, defense industry weapons manufacturers. And in those emails, they were being offered access to hardware and technology, which was only available to the military industrial complex, which was not in the commercial sphere, which you and I could never go and access or buy but the access to it was being extended to um, corporations and companies like Hacking Team who are like satellite companies or satellite service providers for the military industrial complex. So that's yet another example of what I would call tier two. So tier one is like the military is the top of the food chain. The military is the control. This planet and all of our countries not our governments are in control, it's the militaries are in control. They are tier one for access to technology. Tier two is this military industrial complex. Okay, so then tier three. I would consider tier three would be the uh, global, the commercial market for the global elite, right? So this is the people who can, oh, because that's a, just one other thing about that hacking team, the Italian crowd that I was talking to you about a second ago. They, um, that mailing list, the, just to, just to receive the emails, the marketing emails from the defense contractors, uh, cost 8,000 euros. Like you had to subscribe, you had to have a membership and pay 8,000 euros just to even access these lists of, um, of technology hardware that were available for sale from the weapons manufacturers. So that gives you some idea. Again, it's about creating that barrier, right? Like a normal person cannot afford to pay 8,000 euros to receive some marketing emails from a defense contractor. But a corporation, a company um, in the military, as a part of the military industrial complex, what do they care about 8,000 euros? 8,000 euros to them is like $8 to us. So they use money to create a barrier and to restrict that access, access to information about what even is available. And it takes you and I reading something like WikiLeaks years and years after the fact to even begin to get an understanding about what these guys have access to and what is out there in this world. So the next tier down, from the military industrial complex would be, I will put the global elite. And by this, I mean people with money. And I'm sure like you would have seen it because they like to show their stuff off on like, you know, whatever lifestyles of the rich and famous and the many MTV offshoots in more recent years. Um, you will see in the mega mansions, they have technology in their homes, which is beyond the wildest dreams of any consumer. And the reason, once again, that they have that is because they have money. And so those who have been, uh, whose activities have been blessed by the systems of control that run our society have been fiscally rewarded. And not only um does that mean they have a lot of money, but it means they have access to technologies which you and I simply cannot afford. So yet again, money is being used as a barrier, an entry barrier to access to technology and to innovation. So after these guys, then we have the US commercial market. So this is like, you know, somewhere down the track, however many years, you think about like 1990, this is a multimedia portal, right? So maybe 92, these guys are getting access to it. So maybe 95, these guys are starting to get access to it. So now it's 1999 and they're, they're ready to roll it out to the American public. And generally speaking, the American public are the first ones to get access to um, the first regular citizens of the world to get access to technology. So I'll put here... US commercial market. And then after the US commercial market, this is where access to technology becomes a, uh, I'd say almost a bludgeoning tool that is used um, 
for other countries that have um, relationships with the US for whatever, to whatever extent. So I would put here US MIC favored uh, partner countries. So this is where you see the rest of the five eyes is getting, I mean, I can tell you coming from New Zealand. I can absolutely tell you coming from New Zealand. New Zealand, think about it, is one of the four most favoured countries in theory of the United States around the world. You know, the, the English speaking countries are this tight knit group, tight knit group, tight knit group that stick together. Um, and New Zealand was always behind the US on technology. Always. We always had to see and hear about things before they ever made it to us. So New Zealand would still be somewhere close to the top of that list. But now think about somewhere like, and I'm just pulling like a country name out of a hat, Ghana. Like where is Ghana on the, where are the citizens of Ghana on the access to technology waterfall? They are like way the hell down the bottom. And then now think about somewhere like Russia or somewhere like Iran. Where are they on the access to technology waterfall? Not only are they massive targets for R&D espionage, um, for anything they do manage to develop themselves out of their own universities or their own science um, and research, research spaces, but they are also the last to be granted any type of access to um, innovation from the global network. So then we would have at the bottom here, the very, 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 very tail end of the waterfall is the US MIC least favored non-partner countries. I'll just make this full screen so hopefully you can all see it. So there you go. For any of you who were wondering whether I actually make these screens myself, whether I make these slides myself, yes, all of this is my own research, it's my own um, deductions, and it's based on years of research. And if you go back through my body of work and my body of articles, you will discover that every little piece of information I give you here is from research that I did at any given time and wrote about in my long form articles. So I'm just going to save that. And that is an excellent screen, I think, in my opinion, to show the, the way that access to technology is staggered in favor of the global network of intelligence agencies and the military and the warmongers and the war wages of this world and how us little regular people down here are the absolute last to enjoy the fruits of any technological innovation. Okay, heading back to our technology screen, is there anything I missed? Um, right, so AI, of course, is the, is the missing piece. AI is a such a massive topic, obviously. Um, and I want to avoid talking too much in these streams about topics that I intend to do like a whole episode on after the fact. So that's also why in this um, in these screens you won't see surveillance listed. Surveillance is obviously a key factor of political control, of technological control, of all the different areas of society that I'm going to talk about the way they control tonight. Surveillance is really key to that. However, I intend to do an entire separate stream on the methods of surveillance at every layer of society and our lives. Um, so I've decided not to really cover surveillance tonight, even though it obviously is integral to everything that I'm speaking about. So heading back to our slides. Ah, oh, right. And this is where my computer has helpfully dumped my content. So. I think we're actually going to take a one minute break because I'm going to have to pull up um, some screenshots that I took to make sure that exactly that wouldn't happen and fill in the missing gaps and then I'll come back to you guys. 
Um, also, I would probably finish up this lecture in about 15 or 20 minutes, and then I really want to interact with the audience. So any questions that you have, tag me in the chats right now would be awesome. And I will go through and answer as many of those as I can. If you want to reward me for the work that I'm doing right now, you can do so by sharing everywhere that you can, the one versus five i.com website, donations link, re just retweeting and amplifying each other on the social media platforms is a really big deal. Um, Cause I know there are a lot of really good people who have been trying very hard to support this campaign. And I'm lucky in that I have 20 something thousand followers, but a lot of the people who are trying to support this campaign have like 50 or 500 or 5,000 followers. So just looking up the hashtag and supporting each other, supporting the other people and accounts who are trying to spread this message because God knows it's not going to come from CNN. Someone said it, actually I retweeted something today and it was really clever that someone said, I was, they are talking about uh, Galette Jeans or however you pronounce them. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing it correctly. The protests in France. And they said, you can tell a legitimate mass movement when it's greeted by global silence. <laughs> and I was just like, that is so spot on. Because that also works for campaigns like this one. And also for um, the activities and the work of individual activists. You can tell who is a legit activist because... Either they're relentlessly smeared or you have teams of people trying to convince you not to like them or follow their work or they are just met with complete silence. Um, I take great confidence in the fact that in the integrity of the information that I'm sharing, the research that I've done and the just the quality of the information and I think that that stands on its own regardless of the fact that it's me sitting here telling it to you, I think these slides stand on their own. The content stands on its own. It has obvious merit. It has obvious significance and importance. Um, and I think I, I can tell by who shares it um, and who wants other people to also possess this knowledge. Uh, it tells me a lot about um, who I should also be working with and supporting. Um, I can judge that pretty fairly because good people don't want to live in a system of went on and abject control of every facet of society. It's wrong and we've got to do something about it. And I can't do much as one person, but with you guys working with me and you supporting me, I can do so much more than as if I was by my own. So I appreciate everybody who is trying to share this stuff and who's working together to do it. You guys are truly amazing. And that goes for every person who's on the Discord server and everybody who's been helping uh, this campaign already. So if you aren't one of those people, get on board. The stuff's important. I'm going to do something about it. Okay, um, I'm going to actually, Kitty, I might ask our tech people just to rerun the campaign promo video for the next seven minutes. I'm just going to get those last pieces on the slides that I have to fish out of my little backups. And then I'll take you through the last two slides and we'll do a Q and A. Hi, my name is Susie. I'm an activist and a journalist from Auckland, New Zealand. For years, I've worked on controversial issues like the corruption of our intelligence agencies. I was severely targeted as a result of my work. This led to my articles being amplified by the world's most accomplished publisher. In 2016, I made a documentary about how and why I was forced to leave my country. I have now sought refuge in Russia and my situation has become public. On 882 6PR, the voice of Perth. It's 12.30 right now and Tony with you and I'm really happy we finally got through to Moscow to my friend over there, Susie Dawson. You're listening to a 95BFM podcast. Susie Dawson is a Kiwi activist and journalist who worked as a member of Occupy Auckland's media team at that time. Now, five years later and following involvement in GCSB and TPPA opposition, she's seeking asylum in Russia, alleging she has been spied on, harassed and threatened by the police. Welcome back to The Wire. Now, finally on the show today, last week it was announced that Susie Dawson 
will be the new leader of the Internet Party. Welcome to the Jimmy Dore Show. We have a special guest with us. It's Susie Dawson. She's an activist, journalist, former party leader and current president of the Internet Party. Susie Dawson, an activist and citizen journalist currently seeking asylum in Moscow. Susie has written extensively on surveillance and the deep state and claims it's not safe for her in New Zealand. My name is Craig Tuck. I'm a lawyer from New Zealand. I act in the area of international human rights. I act for Susie Dawson along with a group of other lawyers throughout the world who act for journalists and dissenters in high profile cases including the case of Julian Assange. As far back as 2012, Susie has been trying to warn New Zealanders and other citizens around the world about state targeting and surveillance of citizens and the methods being used to do it. Surveillance in New Zealand is now so widespread, it's not an issue of police going and getting a warrant and doing an investigation and then it all coming out in court. The vast majority of the surveillance that's undertaken is never going to be aired in a courtroom. And by that I'm talking about cell phone technologies, I'm talking about lawful interception is the term that the companies that do this like to use. There is a corporation in Wellington, New Zealand called SSI Corp. And you can Google them and you can look at their website. And on their website, they're so good as to explain at length exactly what they do and, and how legal it is for them to do it. And essentially, they can intercept virtually any communication. If they have someone at range, they can hear your actual conversations. But also through cell phones, they can essentially turn them into microphones and hear any conversation that's had within vicinity. They can see your text messages. They can see what photos are on your phone. They can see what files are on your phone. They can read your emails. They can just intercept all kinds of information. Any intelligence service in the world that has significant funding and a real technological research team can own that phone the minute it connects to their network. As soon as you turn it on, it can be theirs. They can turn it into a microphone. They can take pictures from it. They can take the data off of it. But it's important to understand that these things are typically done on a targeted basis. Not only was Susie essentially blowing a whistle on state level spying, she was naming the precise entities that years later it would be proven had in fact been doing it. And the fact that these are private corporations that are doing it should be really concerning to us. The crowd that they got, that they outsourced it to, was TCIL, which was, I believe, Thompson and Clark Investigations Limited. The state is contracting a private company to surveil you. And to me, that's really immoral, absolutely immoral. Some six years later, in December 2018, an official State Services Commission report confirmed that New Zealand government agencies had been employing Thompson and Clark Investigations Limited to target New Zealand citizens. This is a private company that had essentially been instructed by state agencies and departments to spy on citizens. More than a dozen police staff are under investigation for passing sensitive information to the private investigators Thompson and Clark. Thompson and Clark. Security firm Thompson and Clark. Thompson and Clark. Uh, Thompson and Clark. So Thompson and Clark, aren't, aren't they, aren't some of them old police officers? Ah uh, yes, they are. Okay, so does that explain the relationship and the free flow of information? Doesn't it actually seem a bit crass? Um, well. At the end of the day, I guess um, what I trust is people's intent. This report identifies perhaps inappropriately close relationships. Morning teas paid for by um, Thompson and Clark. Invitations to go out for drinks. Were there other companies oh. identified where you inappropriately gave them information or just Thompson and Clark? Um, there, there are a myriad of security companies who inquire of police every day. For instance, insurance mm. uh, security... But that's not my question. People listening to this will think, hey, Thompson and Clark were getting stellar, top-shelf, gold-star treatment from the police. Why? Do you treat other security firms the same as you were treating this one? Yeah. How do you seriously think it looks to, to members of the public listening to this? 
Thompson and Clark hasn't just been paid by the government to spy on Greenpeace and earthquake claimants in Christchurch. Tonight, Checkpoint can reveal the controversial security firm has been also monitoring the activities of another three activist groups in Northland, Coromandel and Wellington and the activities of at least one further claimant. Susie has been involved at the very highest levels with people facing charges from prosecutions coming out of the Eastern District Court of Virginia in the United States. There are more prosecutions to follow of currently unnamed persons. Importantly, information will be coming out in the months to come that will provide transparency and clarity and lead to accountability. Suppression and prosecution of dissenters can't be allowed in New Zealand or elsewhere. That's why Susie's team is launching the hashtag One Versus Five I campaign and with your help can achieve some important victories for democracy and for each and every one of us. Hi everyone, thank you for waiting. I have completed the slides and let's get back into it. So the next thing that we're gonna talk about is how the global network um, control the economic sector, sector worldwide. And I'll just full screen this for you. Right, okay. Um, economics is something that the intelligence agencies are completely obsessed with. There is dozens, if not hundreds, of NSA slides on this topic. One of the great fallacies that the agencies like to circulate is the idea that they do not spy for economic gain. Obama made multiple statements, as cited by the New York Times, claiming that the intelligence services do not target for economic gain. Um, FBI Deputy Director at uh, the Black Hat Tech Security Conference also made the same claim that they do not spy for economic gain. This is total and complete bullshit. They spy every single day for economic gain. And not only do they just spy for economic gain, but they create or uh, they forge international relationships with economic ex experts, organizations, um, and related agencies around the world to maintain their economic supremacy. So they do this in a number of ways. They are obsessed with trade because trade and economics are so closely linked. If you were closely observing the uh, TPP that they were attempting to push through to fast track in America and in more than a dozen countries around the world, you will have noted that the heads of all of the major intelligence services actually signed letters to Obama and to the various leaders in the political sphere in the US, claiming that it was critical to the national security of America and of countries across the global network that the TPP be passed. Now, if this was just merely a trade agreement, why would the intelligence agencies be so concerned about this and the reason is because they have their fingers in every pie that is related to the TPP and of course the TPP established transnational 
tribunals which had uh, legal um, frameworks which usurped the roles of national legislation laws um, and legislators. So what that meant is that no longer would laws be just by a nation state for a nation state, but laws would now be for economic interests and corporations and would supersede uh, the laws of the of nation states. So trade is a huge topic that they're very interested in. We also saw um, from the Snowden files that related to New Zealand that New Zealand's uh, trade envoys who were vying for uh, positions at the World Trade Organization uh, were being supported, the applications were being supported by the Five Eye intelligence agencies who were undertaking espionage on their behalf against candidates from other countries around the world to try to manipulate the outcome of who was appointed to the World Trade Organization. So this is a trade is a really, really, really big deal to the spies. We also see that um, they are obsessed with entities like the World Bank, the World Economic Forum, and like I said, the World Trade Organization and others, other global economic forums are active espionage targets. And actually, I just want to make one point really clear. You hear me talking a lot about the NSA and the global network, but understand that the CIA is an NSA customer. The FBI is an NSA customer, as are the domestic intelligence agencies of the partner countries of the global network. So even though you hear me refer to the NSA, the CIA are integrally involved. I'm hearing in the back of my head Bill Binney saying to me last week, the NSA track them, the CIA whack them. That's not a very nice way to put it, but also the NSA, though he's accurate, absolutely, the NSA uh, harvest the information and the CIA act on the information. So the NSA will spy on the attendees of the World Economic Forum or, um, as we know for a fact, with the UN, but the CIA are the ones who will actually go in and physically infiltrate it. Um, they are the human intelligence. They are the, the people who um, actually get in there on the ground, whereas the NSA are the system spies. They're the ones compromising the systems. There's a better way to put it. The NSA are compromising the systems and the networks, and the CIA are compromising the individuals and the organizations. So just because I'm referring to the NSA, please understand that the global network encompasses human intelligence as well as signal, signals intelligence. In fact, the signals intelligence is uh, collected um, in conjunction with and for the benefit of um, the human intelligence agencies as well. So not only are they obsessed with monitoring global economic forums, but they go so far as to have their own economic forums. This is known as Economic Security Day. They literally have a day of the year, the intelligence agencies, where they bring experts in economics from all around the globe and they to these top secret conferences and they ask them how better may we serve you? Meaning, what types of information can we steal from spying on people that will benefit your corporations, your organizations, which are the economic organizations, particularly the Five Eyes, but more broadly of the global network? Which shows you how ridiculous it is that they claim that they're not spying for economic gain. So some of the NSA customers we know for a fact are the Federal Reserve Bank of America. The Federal Reserve Bank of America is not a government agency. It is a private corporation and it is a customer of the NSA. I've talked quite a bit about NSA customers previously, so I'm not going to get into it in too much detail, but the fact that the Federal Reserve is able to request information from the NSA at will for the benefit of the Federal Reserve um, should also make a laughing stock of the of Obama and the FBI and other agencies' claims that they don't spy for economic gain. 
uh, the US Department of Treasury is an NSA customer. Um, and each of these NSA customers have their own customers. So for example, we found in the documents that the US Department of Agriculture was a customer of the NSA and could request information from the NSA. But the US Department of Agriculture's own customers include major agricultural corporations, for example, Monsanto. So this is how, it's not just about the agencies who are accessing and benefiting from NSA data or information from the global network. It's about the next layer of customers, their customers, the corporations and entities who then profit or obtain the information through um, the NSA customers. We'll call them secondary customers, the secondary customers. So, um, and what are they, how are they obtaining this information? They're obtaining it by espionage. What are they doing? They are um, spying on, usurping, obtaining intellectual property from companies around the world, innovators around the world. I mean, just to give you one example, one of the things we found in the NSA documents was that they were spying on, like they were using references to specific strands of DNA that they were interested in. And they were spying on science laboratories around the world to see if there are any findings about this specific DNA code that they wanted to know about. They are spying on science and research and research and development around the globe and usurping um, the products of that research and development. Now, another thing we found, which was really bizarre and which it took me a long time to put together the pieces on, is that they had um, built, the NSA had built relationships with credit scoring companies in the United States. And I couldn't really work that out. Specifically, they wanted the algorithms of credit scoring agencies. They wanted to know how those agencies make the determinations about their customers and how to score them. And for a long time, I couldn't work that one out. And then eventually I realized why it is that they were wanting to do that. And bear in mind, this is the documents that I'm talking about here that I'm referencing are like 2004, 2005, 2006. And they had actually, the they were working with credit scoring companies who had key executives that were essentially moonlighting for the intelligence agencies. So they had like one foot in the commercial space and one foot in the intelligence agencies. And that's when I realized that we always hear about China as this terrible surveillance state and China is scoring its citizens. Um, but I, I truly believe there is a very high likelihood that such a social scoring uh, system already exists in the Western nations. I believe that it's non-public, it hasn't been acknowledged that they're doing this, but I can't really come up with any other explanation for why the NSA and the global network would be taking the algorithms from credit scoring companies and utilizing it for their own ends. I think it is almost certain that they are already applying some type of scoring or grading system to citizens in the Five Eye countries and probably beyond and possibly globally. Um, we haven't heard about it, we don't know about it yet, but they have the technology to do it. And it's highly likely that they have long since implemented that. And when we look at some of the targeting programs, the watch listing uh, programs, it, this all ties in together. They are using credit scoring technologies or social scoring technologies um, to enhance their targeting techniques when they are deciding who it is they want to target and how much of a priority that target should be. And I mean, that's something that should be intensely concerning to all of us. So also when it comes down to the dollars, you know, the NSA has created slush funds. They are siphoning money off into the NSA corporation. They have access to private equity 
And they also have uh, two-way economic relationships with the partner agencies. So again, this is something we found from the Snowden files that related to New Zealand was that there were slides showing that the NSA was billing the GCSB, which is New Zealand's NSA for services, and was the GCSB are billing the NSA for services. And as I've mentioned many times before, throughout these documents, they refer to themselves as being a business. They refer to themselves as the business. They refer to themselves as being corporations. That's why they have customers and they create products. They are commercial entities and commercial undertakings. They invoice and receive funds and they pay for services to other partner agencies. So it's not just about the public funding. It's not just about the money that they squeeze out of Congress. It's also about the money that they're squeezing out of billing in the commercial space. In the commercial sector, they are essentially commercial operators. But they're commercial operators that have access to the most sensitive economic and trade uh, secrets globally. And then are exploiting them on behalf of their customers, which is obviously way beyond terrorism or national security. Okay, and then our final slide for today, and then I'll move into some questions, is the ways in which they are subverting and controlling education. So one of the things that, again, is right throughout the NSA documents is they constantly have these training sessions where they invite, um, not just invite, but actually pay uh, so-called subject matter experts from uh, universities and right across the education, education sphere to come to the CIA, come to the NSA and hold these special uh, training conferences or meetings about whatever happens to be the area of expertise, whether it be geopolitics or whether it be economics or whether it be international relations or whatever else. So professors are on payroll getting paid mega bucks by the intelligence agencies to come and lecture to the employees of the intelligence agencies. But then that goes the other way around as well, because then we see executives from the intelligence agencies who are also going and speaking at universities, giving keynotes um, at universities, or who are being invited as a visiting um, professor, I mean, give me the word, or, you know, um, are, are having commercial relationships, essentially, is what it boils down to with uh, universities. So the privatization, too, of education has only been increasing um, the veracity of this. So we have um, now the chancellors earning hundreds of thousands of dollars and these visiting speakers getting paid these humongous speaking fees and the ability of universities to uh, maintain any kind of independence from the intelligence agencies is being constantly eroded. Then of course you have the endowments and this is where you see the John McCain library or the this, that or the other thing, right? How many times do we see these warmongering figures um, have university endowments or are funding universities one way or another, um, how many times do we see even corporations that are also funding uh, buildings or programs or whatever enterprises on university campuses? Now, why are they doing this? They're doing this because in the NSA documents, they consider the universities to be recruiting pools. Now, if you've heard John Kiriakou, the CIA torture whistleblower speak, you'll know that he was recruited out of university. He was recruited by a university professor. If you were here for last week's episode, um, you will have seen CVs of intelligence professional, professionals who were involved in uh, so-called terrorism intelligence programs. And then the next listing on their CV is professor at whatever university. So you see this revolving door where it's not just that intelligence agents are running for office. Um, it's not just that they are becoming talking heads on corporate media. 
but also they are essentially infiltrating and operating um, as a faculty at major universities and learning institutions. And you see, in particular, there are disciplines, at, specific disciplines at universities, and that is just as two examples, linguistics and international relations. Now, it is so universally accepted and known that these disciplines are um, spy disciplines, is what it comes down to, that it, it's not something that's even hidden. And when you look through the CVs on IC Watch, you see time and time again, linguistics, 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 international relations, international relations, international relations. These are entire learning disciplines that have been basically taken over by spies. International relations is supposed to mean diplomacy. Diplomacy is supposed to prevent war. But what it's come down to is that the practices of diplomacy and the discipline of international relations has been uh, effectively taken over and monopolized by people who ultimately require war. They require war to expand their funding and expand their um, abilities. And they require war ultimately uh, so that they can profit for themselves and their own careers and when they inevitably move into the private sector one way or another. So diplomacy as being about war is just very Orwellian. It's very war is peace. Uh, linguistics as well, I should mention that NSA talked about having somewhere around 15,000 employees back in 2004, and I think something like eight to 10,000 of those were linguistics um, professionals. So it's kind of a similar thing. If you're going to learn a foreign language, you're going to become a spy, apparently. If you're going to study diplomacy and international relations, you're going to become a spy. Um, it's just to me it just makes a mockery it makes a mockery of the learning institutions it makes a, lock, a mockery of the disciplines themselves um and it makes a mockery of of the services that are supposed to be provided by people who study those things and it also to be honest gives a dirty name to anyone who just genuinely studies linguistics or international relations who doesn't actually want to become a spy or become a part of the war machine Right, and then there is appropriation of the products or the output of um, universities and educational facilities. So one of the things that really shocked me uh, in the NSA documents, and I'll never forget, is that they, um, I talked last week about how the spies are obsessed with risk management, but they're also obsessed with strategy. They're obsessed with, What's the world going to be like in five years? What's it going to be like in 10 years? What's it going to be like in 20 years? And just like corporations do, they're obsessed with creating these long, what we call long-range operational plans, LROPs in corporate speak in corporate sector. Um, so they have these five-year plans, 10-year plans, 20-year plans for trying to stay ahead of the trajectory of um, the progress of human society. But... Incredibly, they decided that their best way to uh, brainstorm what the world could be like in 20 years' time was to have a intermediary organisation, an NGO, sponsor competitions for high school kids to write papers about what the world would be like in 20 years and to give them different scenarios um, under which to group their ideas. And then through this intermediary organization, the NSA usurped the ideas of tens of thousands of school children across America and then took their ideas, unbeknownst to them and their families, took those ideas and incorporated them into the strategic planning for the intelligence agencies. So literally your kid comes home from school and says, hey, if I write this essay about what the world would be like in 20 years time, I can win a couple hundred dollars and get a certificate. And you think, wow, that's so great, cool. Not knowing that what that kid writes can literally end up becoming NSA policy going forward, can be incorporated into their strategic forecasting. I just found that 
just unbelievably ridiculous, but also a great example of how everyday citizens are impacted, directly impacted by the intelligence agencies without even having the foggiest idea that it's that it's occurring or that it's happening to them. And of course, then they use these ruses. So they use um, a variety of ruses, including entire organizations that are established for the precise reason of buff, creating a buffer between uh, the NSA, what the NSA wants to do and who they want to get it from. So they will have organizations like the one I just talked about for the, the sur survey of these um, high school essays that exist solely to uh, channel information to the NSA or to, to perform some service on behalf of the NSA that the NSA doesn't want to be seen to be doing itself. It doesn't want to be seen to be actively recruiting. It doesn't want to seem to be consuming the ideas and uh, intellectual property of a bunch of teenagers. So they create these buffer organizations and these ruses to explain, you know, on the surface why they are wanting to obtain whatever information without it being able to be tracked directly back to the agency. And then, of course, think tanks. I don't think I really need to talk much about think tanks because I think everybody probably realizes that every think tank has an agenda. A lot of think tanks have uh, direct ties to intelligence agencies. A lot of them are started by people who have backgrounds in the intelligence agencies. And a lot of them are directly funded by the military industrial complex. And obvi obviously those think tanks are then performing research or producing so-called scientific reports um, that ultimately are serving those who fund them or those who have established them. Okay, so that is my basic introduction for you into the fundaments of the ways that the intelligence agencies are controlling society, which is once again, they are meddling in and controlling the political sphere. They are meddling in and controlling technology at a global level, they are meddling in and controlling and exploiting economics, world and economic systems worldwide, and they are exploiting and controlling um, education. Now, I could easily have added one more layer in there, and that would have been the social layer, because absolutely they are also uh, infiltrating, sabotaging, exploiting social progress their obsession with targeting activist movements um, is precisely because activist movements have the capacity and potential to create uh, social change and to progress human society in ways that the intelligence agencies don't want them to progress. And once again, which kind of brings us back to the beginning of this conversation, which is where I talked about how they don't really care if a left-wing or right-wing government is in. All they really care about is that their military uh, partnership agreements aren't affected and their intelligence sharing agreements aren't affected. Um, in the study of fusion centers, we discovered that uh, the intelligence agencies had been infiltrating and sabotaging both left and right-wing social movements. So in particular, in the exact example that we found, um, they had been targeting and infiltrating both pro-choice and pro-life organizations. So it doesn't even matter what side of an issue you sit on. They will monitor and spy on and target and destabilize any group that's wanting any kind of change whether it is a change in one direction or a change in the other direction. And the reason that they do that is because they want to maintain the status quo at all costs. They don't want change. They want to maintain the status quo. And why do they want to maintain the status quo? Because they are the status quo. Because they are in control. And they don't want to lose a, an inch of that control one way or the other in either direction. They are acting to maintain their own global supremacy over all of our societies. And they subvert every aspect, every fundamental pillar of human society in order to do so every single day. 
Okay, thank you for sitting through that with me. I really appreciate it. It went a little bit longer than I was hoping. Um, I'm now going to have a chat with you. So bear with me while I go through chat and see if you guys had any questions for me. Thank you for all the kind comments, you guys. Someone saying that um, when they worked at Georgetown University, there was a think tank there with members from Council on Foreign Relations. Council on Foreign Relations is one of those globalist organizations. And when I say globalist, okay, this is, I'm not taking a political position. Um, these intelligence agencies are globalist agencies and you, it says it all the way through their own documents. They want control over every inch of the globe. They want visibility, these are their own words, they want visibility over every inch of the globe. They want to collect it all, all of the information, all the data on the globe. I believe in decentralization. I believe in decentralization for the protection of, of humans around the world. I do not want there to be one master internet, uh, international intelligence data scam cabal that's in control of everything like we have now. And unfortunately, they're probably like, if I had to guess, probably 85, maybe 90% of the way towards that total global domination that they want to have. And that is just terrible. And Council on Foreign Relations is a fantastic example of an organization that exists only to maintain that status quo of uh, control over human society worldwide. And if I had my way, I would dismantle that organization. <laughs> social media um, admins, please, hi to the people from New Zealand saying hi to me, um, please can you highlight any questions that are for me because there are so many comments in the chat, I'm, it's really difficult for me to find them. Okay, so Danimation says that the credit rating probing and or scoring may not just be about improving targeting systems, but also about knowing financial positions of others who can be solicited to serve the global network. I would completely agree with that. I think it's both a method of harvesting targets um, and also identifying uh, people who may be, I mean, this is the thing, like, you kind of target it either way, like either they target you for recruitment or they target you because they want to destroy you or they, there's a myriad of reasons why they might target somebody or wants, you know, want them to be on their radar. But I think ultimately it comes back to them wanting to know everything about everyone. Um, and that's pretty scary. That's pretty scary. Uh, Peace Power says, Susie, I'm reading the latest NDAA, the National Defence Authorization Act for 2020, and all of your topics are spelled out in it. I'll provide you with an overview soon. Funding and directives for EA. I would love you to send me a copy of that agreement because I will absolutely put it on the list of things that we can sit and read through together and discuss because that's the type of thing we need to be aware of and we need to be on top of and we need to be talking about. Absolutely. Question from YouTube chat. Susie, we are just plebs. How can we actually do anything as citizens? Well, basically by being active and by doing it together and by banding together. I mean, Ray McGovern would tell you, he would quote, I believe, I Stone, and he would say, um, it's not important that we win, it's important that we try. I totally agree. I can't stand the defeatist attitude. I can't stand the, oh, but they have so much money and they're so powerful and blah, blah. So what, we just sit down and take it and like let them destroy the planet? I'm not into that. I'm into let's do what the hell we can and let's inspire as many people as possible to group up around us and do what the hell we can. Um, in fact, I would go so far as to also quote um, so Alice Walker, I think, my one of my best friends, an amazing activist in New Zealand, um, also quotes, and she says, uh, activism is the rent that I pay for living on this planet. 
um, she believes it is every human's duty to to do something. And you look at every every progress in human history that's come has come from people getting off their asses and fighting the power, literally fighting the power. That's what has gained us anything that we've ever had that was worth having has come from that. So I don't think we say we are just plebs. I think we say we are just humans like the humans who have come before us and who have fought massive fights against great power and who many times have lost those fights and who sometimes have been victorious and sometimes have made progress. Um, I do think that the global network is a Wizard of Oz situation. Like, they can do some really nasty shit to individuals. They could do some really nasty stuff to specific um, organizations or specific targeted groups of people. But they can't take all of us on everywhere. And I think that if we make this enough of an issue and we make people aware of it enough, and particularly, I'll tell you when change will come, particularly if we teach people the aspect that uh, these intelligence agencies render the entire electoral process obsolete, null, and void, if you can uh, get people to buy out of the spectacle of the election cycle and actually start seriously absorbing, absorbing information like this and doing something about it, that will rock the system badly enough that something will have to change. That will rock the system badly enough that politicians will actually have to start reigning in these agencies or at least pretending to have some control over them. Um, that's really where we've got to go. Step one is make people aware and educate them. And step two is to start building some of our own systems to um, subvert and buy out, buy out of the global network. What is my take on Bush Cheney 911 spook Kofa Black sitting on the board of directors of Burisma Holdings, the same as Hunter Biden, and especially that nobody is talking of Kofa Black? Um, I would describe that as another day in paradise. I mean, thinking like Eric Prince and even Peter Thiel, and there is an endless, endless cross left right spectrum elite. Um, network of relationships that uh, you know they're just the revolving doors the revolving doors between the MIC the military industrial complex and the corporations um, and that's one of the most interesting factors is that when you look into the business relationships and the, the money um, these are not isolated groups the leftists are not isolated from the from the conservatives um, Look, Clinton Foundation is a classic example. Look at the client list of the Clinton Foundation. <laughs> it's, it, most of the countries on this planet, most of the regimes on this planet, it was the world's greatest open uh, mafia scam. And entire countries were, if not entire regions, were participating in it um, because that, it was just known that that's the way that you do business. It's corruption on an epic scale. And you find it with, I'm, oh God, what's his name? There's so many of these ex CIA, ex FBI guys um, that are in the same boat. I'm um, Philip Mudd, Phil Mudd, um, the ex CIA deputy director, also seen frequent CNN uh, host, if not actually outright on payroll there permanently, um, says, openly brags and says, Oh, yes, I'm working for a boutique wealth management fund. I do a couple of days a month in there. Um, what the hell? Like, seriously. And this is it. These guys, you know, the banking, the finance, the it, it's all interrelated, interwoven with the intelligence agencies. It's very difficult to tell whether the intelligence agencies work for the banks or the banks work for the intelligence agencies. Banks have been set up by intelligence agencies. They're all one in the same thing. You can't really pick them apart. And, you know, I'm all for, like, good invested in good journalism that goes after one corrupt guy and hopefully takes him down and hopefully, like, puts a little dent in whatever aspect of the network. But I also firmly believe that the systems are the problem here. 
I can't just, I mean, I, I started out my journalism, you know, reporting on corruption in Minister, Minister of Police, reporting on corruption in Minister of Justice, reporting on corruption of the Prime Minister. Um, but all of them are just employees. They're just like middle managers. They, um, I couldn't even hate John Key for all the horrible stuff that he was responsible in doing to me and many other activists and journalists in New Zealand. I couldn't even hate him because I had this understanding, this inherent understanding that if it wasn't him, it would be someone else. These people are, it's the same actually with, I feel the same about the infiltrators of activist movements, uh, especially with this advent of private security contractors and private intelligence companies. Um, you get saboteur X, Y or Z in a movement it actually doesn't, people get really fixated on the personalities and, and on the specific person who's doing the sabotage. But if you get rid of that person, which takes like months in, in any activist movement to finally get a saboteur, a saboteur out, is very, very time consuming to do. The next one just gets put in, you're back to square one. There's always going to be the next Stasi asshole willing to come in and sell. There's always going to be the next opportunist willing to take the money, you know, and be on the board of whatever and do whatever evil shit. But at the end of the day, as far as I can see, none of them can operate without these systems. None of them can operate without the system, the intelligence, without the global network. If the global network was literally shut down, the information that they use to maintain their supremacy would be gone and their power would be gone. How many times have we hear information is power, information is power? Why was WikiLeaks the greatest threat to them? Because WikiLeaks was taking the information that was their power and was releasing it to the general public. And the general public were obtaining information and therefore obtaining power that traditionally had been restricted only to these elites. And so I really feel like we have got to go after the systems. We can't just go after Mickey Mouse, A, B, or C anymore. We need to go after the systems of control that enable this globalist supremacy uh, to be maintained. Susie, do I know anyone who has ever successfully found surveillance equipment that has been placed by some third party in the home workplace or vehicle, bugs and cameras? Yes, I do. Um, ask me about this question next week and I will talk about it at length. I know organisations that have run counter surveillance operations and been able to obtain proof of them being monitored and including finding equipment. And I also know some individuals um, in the UK and in Europe who also we're able to find that out and, and get proof of it. Uh, I, also, there is places like the Citizen Lab in Canada, which has many, many times proven uh, spyware or um, commercial hacking, military hacking, uh, military-grade hacking software has been planted on activists or various targets, um, devices. So, yeah, I do know about that, and I'll tell you more about it next week when I just cover surveillance as a topic exclusively for the entire session. Wow, you guys, chat's moving so fast. Thank you, everyone who's saying really nice things to me. I really appreciate it. Uh, generally speaking, like I've missed so much while I'm on the stream, but generally speaking, sometime in the next day or two, I actually do go back and watch the stream again and go and read through all the chats and see everything that everybody said. So I will pick up on stuff after the fact. You're also... I mean, a lot of people reach out to me every single day. I get messages on all different platforms. I get emails. Um, the best and most effective avenue to contact me is actually on discord because on discord i'm working with our campaign team every day and i'm most responsive on discord not necessarily in the channels but you can actually private message me on discord so if you have something that you're like dying burning to tell me uh discord is the best way for you to do that and you can go to one versus five i.com slash discord and then message susie 3d 
or talk I mean our whole team's there so you can talk to any of our people and they'll help you um Someone is asking, Tulsi Gabbard is or was on the Council of Foreign Relations, I've heard. What do you think of her and her chances of taking on the MEC? I don't think she was on the Council of Foreign Relations. I think she was, like, nominated for something by them or was uh, some specific program had funded in some way something about her. Look, I just don't know about Tulsi, and that's nothing personal about Tulsi at all. Um, but I just look at the history, like how many times can we be told that we, you know, hope and change by a politician only to discover that that politician either is not going to do a goddamn thing that they said they would or is going to be prevented from doing a goddamn thing that they said they would. I am personally past the point of believing that the political system is going to produce justice. I am way past that point, whether it's uh, Sanders or Warren or Tulsi Gabbard or whoever the hell. This control system that we've just been discussing for the last three hours doesn't really give a shit who of any of those. And, like, sure, they smear Tulsi, they won't let her on the stage because they don't want hear pe people to even hear anti-war messages. But I'm pretty damn sure you could just make her the president tomorrow and she would not be able to fix the things that we're talking about. The things that we're talking about will require large sectors of society to know about, care about, and act to do something about. Um, we need to make the intelligence agencies a dirty word. It needs to become painfully embarrassing to admit that you've ever worked for an intelligence agency. It needs to become socially unacceptable to have any affiliation with them. And then we will see some change. Like social stigma is a really like big thing, right? And we can use that to our favor. Rather than them creating social stigmas to break relationships, we should be creating social stigmas around these agencies. They are facilitating wars every day. Every single bomb that is dropped is dropped using information from the global network, using the personnel of the global network. So if we don't like war, we can't like the spies. If we don't want war, we can't like the, the systems that facilitate and allow those wars to be perpetuated. So that's the message that I want to hear coming out in the coming years. And it could take years to build a movement like this, but God, we've made a lot of progress for like one month. You know, we're doing pretty damn well. In fact, for one month, we've already got well over a hundred, maybe hundreds of people who've joined the discord. Um, Tulsi has the boldest talk, but is running in the Dem party. I don't think anyone can make change from within. Jesse Ventura, however, is willing to do it from independent Greens. Yeah, I just think it's just back to the same old thing. Like, the, the political system is a field in which the military industrial complex is comfortable operating in and has established control over. And I think that any... Um, destabilization of those agencies will have to come from a quarter in which they don't control. And social movements are our, our best chance, and de decentralized social movements are our best chance of that. Did the NSA documents state or allude to what they were looking for when scanning DNA databases? Um, Possibly is the answer. Now, what we found was specific strands, like literally like alphanumeric codes for DNA. Um, we did know who they were gathering on behalf of. I would have to double back and see. A lot of the science and technology stuff went totally over my head. See, this is the thing is that um, people need to really understand my limitations um, because I do have some pretty serious limitations. For example, I literally am a high school dropout. I was great at some subjects. I was even advanced at some subjects, but I was also terrible abject failure at other subjects. One of those subjects was science. I totally flunked, failed science so bad. I've never had any interest in science. It's just not my thing. I know it's the thing of, many, you know, many people love it and, and Science is a big deal to them, but it's just not my thing. So when I'm studying thousands of NSA documents, I might go, oh, that's interesting that they're looking at DNA. 
but I would not have a goddamn clue about any of the scientific language, et cetera, that's being employed around that. So it would take somebody who has a lot more knowledge than me to go back through those Decipher You episodes, find those NSA files, read through them and see what else they can get out of them. Um, really, I'm giving the best that I can based on my own research and knowledge and my own interests, but I am not like an all-rounder across the board that can tell you everything about everything. Certainly not. And, and I get questions all the time, every single day. I get like, um, why aren't you talking about this? Why aren't you talking about that? Why aren't you talking about the other thing? Look, guys, I'm talking about the fruits of my research, of my interests, and of my experience. I do not for one second lay claim to knowing about other people's uh, interests, other people's experiences, other people's priorities. Like at the end of the day, if you're watching my content, you're going to see my interests, my experiences, and my priorities. So um, it's kind of, I think, a bit silly to try and uh, hold it against somebody for them not talking about something that's not the area of interest or not in their experience. Okay, classic example. Slow News Day has said to me, Susie, do you plan on having a discussion on some ambulant torture? I don't even know what some ambulant means. I would literally have to go and type that into a like online dictionary and find out what it means. I'm assuming that it means something like around sound waves or something like this. I don't know. I can tell you quite a bit about um, weaponry that has been employed against protest movements that, that is uh, sonar based. But like I said, I'm guessing that that's what even what somnambulant means. So slow news day, there's probably a good chance that you will obviously know more about that topic than me. And I am very, very happy for people who know more than I do about different topics to pursue those different topics to the best of their ability and, and to get that information out. I'm not trying to stymie doing so just because I don't know about something. Okay, someone's saying sleep. See, there we go. I don't even have a clue that that's about sleep, right? I can tell you about what I know about, but I can't tell you about things I don't know about. So I'm sorry, epic fail on that front on my part. <laughs> someone's just got to love that New Zealand humility <laughs> well it's so true you know things I've spent nine years studying I can tell you about but things that I fucking flunked when I was 15 I definitely can't tell you about sorry okay last call for questions I'm about 14,000 comments behind I think I'm going to um, be kind to myself and wrap it here, guys. I really wanted, and ladies, I really wanted to do a shorter stream tonight um, because I'm balancing a lot of other things. Um, I'm really, I'm really happy and heartened to see how active you guys are in the chat and how much you obviously care about this stuff and that is resonating with you. That means the world to me. Uh, to be honest with you, because just to know that this research has come to something, that it actually means something to people and that um, it's helping to expand their mind, um, that's really the greatest thing that I could ever ask for. That is that is a total validation of the time and the effort and, and what I've been through in these years. So <sighs> thank you very, 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 very much for being here. Um, I will ask you again, please donate. I think we're 21%, last I saw anyway, we're 21% of the way to achieving our goal to pay for the first leg of suing the crap out of these agencies who totally destroyed my life. Um, so I would really appreciate you sharing that and helping to support this campaign. For years, I had no hope whatsoever that I would ever even be able to try to get any justice for what had been done. Um, I can't even begin to tell you what these people cost me. Um, I don't even want to go there because emotionally I can't. That's like a, a whole other thing. But they cost me damn near everything. 
um, accept our lives and that's somewhat of a miracle. And for the first time in a decade, I have competent, respected legal representation who have assessed my claims and my evidence and verified the veracity of them and have the guts and the ability to take these people on in court. So I would deeply appreciate you helping to keep me and my family alive and in one piece and me still able to do this work and continue doing what I do and to give me that hope of achieving some justice and holding these people to account for their total violations of not just my human rights but also of their own duties and rights to the public that funds them. So please, I beg you, go to oneversus5i.com, share all the information, take all the steps on the website to promote the campaign and spread that donate link anywhere that you can and let's push this forward. I would love next week to be able to give you an update and tell you that we've raised even more than 21%. Um, and I'm going to keep doing these weekly streams going forward. There's no shortage of content for us to talk about. I am planning to do the surveillance special next week. We will spend the whole time talking about surveillance. And we, the following week, I will do, I think it will be the following week, I'll do Understanding World War Three, And then we're going to get into geopolitics, role of CIA, um, and if you actually want to cheat, you can go and look up my article, Understanding World War Three, and um, go through that. There's a lot of dynamite stuff in there. Um, and then after, the, those are the two that I was going to, I really wanted to get out of the way fronting myself. And then the following weeks, spoiler alert, I will begin to bring on some subject matter experts that know even more than I do and can give us greater contextualization about the activities of these intelligence agencies. So then I will get to go back into the interviewer role rather than fronting it myself. Okay, I love you all. Thank you for the myriad amazing comments and all the feedback. And I will talk to you throughout this week. I will get a short campaign video out to an update video sometime this week. Thank you to my amazing tech team. Thank you to the incredible social media team operating on God knows what, six, seven, eight different platforms right now to promote this. Thank you to everybody who has watched it, to everybody who cares about this information, to everybody who spends their time absorbing and discussing this instead of watching the Kardashians or something. Thank you so much. Take care and I'll see you next week. to make something really really clear if you are anti-war you must be anti-spies and the reason for that is because every single bomb that is dropped on any country on this planet is dropped using intelligence agencies targeting systems and information and data gathered by them. There are NSA staff and personnel on site on the ground with the operational military personnel in the war zones, and they are using the same targeting systems, they call them the real-time targeting gateway, is specifically what they were using. And there's a number of databases and, and networks that they use, but every single bomb dropped or military operation undertaken is enabled by this intelligence, transnational intelligence cabal. And the targeting that has been brought home to citizens around the world, the targeting of citizens in our home countries around the world, uses that same military targeting process and the same targeting systems um, against us in our home territory. So our inability to realise the role of the intelligence agencies in the war zones has ultimately resulted in it not just being about 
them bombing brown people in a foreign country. It is now our ignorance has led to our own our own demise. So yet again, we see that these so-called oversight um, mechanisms are just completely uh, inept and irrelevant, unable to perform their tasks. Um, They don't have sufficient uh, mechanisms to uh, hold these agencies to account. And ultimately, when these agencies are running roughshod over the court system in the ways that have already discussed, they're running roughshod over the political system and the democratic system in the ways that we've already discussed, and they um, are escaping any uh, oversight mechanism, uh, there is only one remaining option, and that is for people to take it upon themselves to organise and to hold them to account. That's it. We know the media is not going to do it. We know the media has been completely infiltrated by these agencies which is yet another topic for another show. Um, But if the media won't do it, if the political sphere can't do it, if the courts can't do it, and if oversight mechanisms can't do it, it's on you and me, guys. That's it. It's on you and me and all of us. Um, And as far as I'm concerned, I mean, the greatest polluters on this planet are the military, the greatest perpetuators of war on this planet are obviously the militaries. And every single one of these countries that has a partnership agreement with the global network is facing privatisation agendas, austerity agendas, widespread cutting of social services, uh, GMO, you know, poisoning of the food chain, uh, theft and or contamination of the water, um, the infrastructure is all privatised and sold off, local manufacturing is killed, these mass trade deals are implemented to undercut, again, to enhance corporate power and corporate profits and to undercut um, everyday people. And the social and economic outcomes for the nations who are partnered with the global network are consistently getting worse, just like they have in New Zealand. The countries who partner with the global network are destroyed. Ultimately, they're socially and economically destroyed. So it's not even that giving them all of our data and letting them mass surveil us and everything is turning some kind of profit. It's not. It's actually putting us in a worse situation uh, than we've ever been in. So subjugation or becoming a vassal state of the global network is not improving the quality of life for anyone. To the contrary, it's, it's destroying our quality of life. And that is yet another reason that we've got to take them on. They are bleeding uh, their own countries dry. smear agents rely on social pressure so they rely on guilt by association and and social pressure so you've got to be the type of person that isn't um isn't scared to uh take an opinion that's contrary to whatever is being uh publicly pushed or whatever is uh seems to be socially acceptable you have to be willing to speak the truth because it's the truth and not speak what everybody else is saying because then you get social credit for saying the same thing as everyone else. Um, You've got to be willing to be that black sheep, you know, you've got to be willing to be that the person who um, maybe looks strange for saying something different than what others believe. Um, You have to care about the truth more than you care about kudos from your peers. Uh, and eventually your peers will catch up with you. That's what I've learned. I have come 
come to the conclusion after years of all of the study and learning everything that I have learned that those systems have got to go. They have got to go. They have got to be defunded, shut down, got rid of, goodbye, no more. Whether it is by the means that Iowera, Jacob Applebaum talked about when he said what we need to do is go to the Utah data storage facility of NSA and shut off the water because without water they can't have the cooling systems for the computers that are that they need to store all of this data that they're stealing from everybody that they're spying on through mass surveillance. Whether it is through a mass movement, whether it's civil disobedience or through um, a coordinated mass movement, I am not okay. Personally, I am not okay with an international intelligence cabal not only facilitating the murder of millions of people in war zones across the planet, but also targeting an ever-expanding section of society um, domestically within their own countries. I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with them superseding and watering down and abusing law in the legal process. I'm not okay with them destroying due process and bastardizing the the entire judicial system. I'm not okay with them undermining the entire political system and turning it into nothing but a puppet reality TV um, theater show while they do whatever the hell they want to in the background. I'm not okay with them killing people quickly in wars and I'm not okay with them killing people slowly domestically in our own countries. And I'm sure as hell not okay with saying nothing about it and pretending that everything's fine and worrying about, you know, what movie I'm going to see this week. I'm not okay with any of that. And if I'm the only person on planet earth that gives a shit, I'm still going to sit here and say this because I'm not okay with that. And none of us should be okay with that. George Bush, I'm, I mean, I'm old enough to rem- remember him saying the whole world is a battlefield, that in the war on terror, the whole world is the battlefield. And we just thought, oh, yeah, this is like overblown politicians, rhetoric, you know, it's just George W. Bush, he says all kinds of shit. But no, they weren't joking. They weren't joking. Their plan was to have the ability to target in real time any person on this planet, regardless of what country they lived in. And that is what they expanded their systems to have the capacity to be able to do. And that is what they have been doing ever since. And every single year, the problem is getting more widespread and it's getting worse. already I, I predicted it years ago I said even in my documentary in 2016 I said eventually they will have to target they will expand to target all sectors of society and in the 2018 state services commission require inquiry in New Zealand we discovered that the very companies the very private intelligence contractors that I'd been naming since 2012 as being involved in targeting citizens on for political reasons were not just targeting journalists, which they were, not just targeting um, political parties, including my own political party, Internet Party, uh, were not just targeting dissidents or threats to national security. They had been targeting uh, child uh, abuse victims who had pending claims against the government. They had been targeting earthquake insurance claimants people whose homes had been destroyed in the Christchurch earthquake who had uh, pending insurance um, claims against the government or specifically against a government agency Southern, called Southern Response were being targeted and spied on by private intelligence agencies uh, engaged by government departments 
and paid for with taxpayer dollars. So this is what I mean. You know, there are a lot of people, oh, well, Susie's an investigative journalist and activist, so of course the target here. Well, how about these people are insurance claimants? Does that mean they should be targeted? Does that mean child abuse survivors should be targeted? Um, at like what point do we decide to stop victim blaming and start looking at those who are doing the targeting and not those who are being targeted? I also wanted to talk tonight about risk. Risk. Because um, risk, there's there's two types of risk. There's a risk that we face as activists and journalists. And there is the risk, the fear-driven risk that these agencies are obsessed with. Because the, the greatest irony is that for all of their trying to instill fear in other people, these agents are really scared. They're constantly scared. They live in a constant state of fear. They consider um, what they do to be risk management. And if you've read an article that I wrote called Glenn Greenwald and the Irrelevance of Electoral Politics, I wrote that in 2014 after Glenn had appeared in New Zealand. Um, and in that, I talk about how one of the principles of business is risk management and how the intelligence agencies view everything that they do uh, in terms of risk management. Um, the risk, they think of the risk to um, themselves and they're constantly obsessed with minimizing risk. Um, so whereas we as activists and journalists think about overcoming fear and taking risks, we consciously take risks. Like I consciously take risks all the time because the principle is more important to me than trying to personally stay safe. Uh, the spies are the opposite. The spies are absolutely fucking petrified of risk and everything that they do, the, the obsession with deniability, their obsession with cover, their obsession with uh, creating legends, manufactured falsehoods, lies, is all about trying to minimise the risk to themselves. So the Julian Assanges of this world set aside any fear of personal risk for principle and the spies set aside principle uh, to minimise personal risk. I, the other thing I keep getting asked this week is, why do I do what I do? Like, why am I, why am I doing this? Um, well, it's pretty simple from my perspective, really. So I'm acting on principle primarily because, like I said, I'm not okay with what is being done and I'm not okay with just sitting around and waiting for the continuation of it and for the, it to continue to get worse at the pace that it has been getting worse. I mean, think about it. It's only been like really 20 years that we've gone from, you know, the shock and awe to full-on dystopia. Like it's actually been less than 20 years. Um, and it, things are not getting better of their own accord. Um, but the other reason I keep getting told, like, oh, you're so brave, you're taking such a big risk. Um, these agencies put me through hell in New Zealand. The, you know, I tried to talk, I, I did as much as I could to explain in my one hour documentary in 2016 as to what I'd actually been put through. Um, but they consciously and deliberately uh, terrified, and I'd say petrified is actually the right word, they petrified me on a daily basis. Um, through myriad uh, means and ways, and they endangered me over and over and over and over again. And the net result of them doing that to me uh, immunised me to it because you actually can't live in a state of permanent fear. And at a certain point, 
you no longer have a fair response to the bullies who are doing that to you. It's like every kid who gets bullied and bullied and bullied and bullied, you know, eventually they have that day where they snap. Well, I definitely got to that. (laughs) It didn't take me that long, really. I got to that and I started thinking, you know what? I don't care if you guys have billions of dollars and I have nothing. I don't care if you guys have tens of thousands of personnel and I have a ragtag team of six people in a citizens media team, I am going to fight you tooth and fucking nail because what you are doing is immoral and unethical and anti-human and you have no right to do it, no matter how many laws that you write to suit yourselves, no matter how many times you indemnify yourself retroactively, no matter what justification you come up with, no matter how many politicians you bribe or buy, no matter how much technology you you develop, you don't have a natural right to any of it. And we do have natural rights as citizens. We do have natural rights as human beings. And that has to, that has to count for more than the artificial uh, power that is uh, seized and uh, monopolized by these agencies and it's going to take us standing up to them and telling them no no you cannot keep doing this 